Good evening and welcome to the November 8, 2011 regular scheduled meeting of the Rossmore Community Services District meeting. Ms. Steering, would you give us a roll call? Director Kaler um, is absent, is that correct? Uh, Director Casey? Here. Director Ripps? Here. Director Maynard? Here. President Coletta? Here. It was brought to our attention a few weeks ago that when we turn our backs during the Pledge of Allegiance, you cannot hear us, perhaps, on television because of the mics, but for those watching tomorrow or when you're bored during the month and you have nothing to do and you scroll through channel three, you should see with us with our backs turned. We are really pledging our allegiance to the flag of the United States. So at this time, would you join us as we face the flag and pledge allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you for joining us. All right, Mr. Tabwater, do we have any presentations this evening? Yes, sir, we do. Uh, we have Lieutenant Wren, who is going to present the quarterly crime statistics. For the record, Mr. Kaler, welcome. We just started. Good evening. We're prompt. Uh, Director Kaler is present tonight. Yes, thank you. All right, Lieutenant Wren, you want to start us off? Kaler is present. Something like that. Good evening. Good evening. I have uh, quarterly crime statistics in front of me. Um, as I keep kind of uh, adjusting these format wise to try and be so that just trying to get them to make the most sense. I think if we take a look at do you have the other slide that's just the numbers. Um, this one? There you go. Okay. Um, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. uh, you'll see that uh, the numbers are up in 2011, most of which can be attributed to property crimes. We had, uh, we've had a rough couple of months as it relates to all types of property, thefts from cars, um, uh, just, just theft in general. We are <clears throat> fortunate um, that our crimes against persons of co are, are still down, but crimes against property have, were up and we've kind of gotten them to, to level off just a bit. Actually, <clears throat> although it's the next, the beginning of the next quarter, just today at about four o'clock, I got my October numbers in, and those are not before you, but I have them in front of me, and, and we're doing pretty good in October, which is, I've put a lot of effort into the end of September and October. The only area that's disturbing me is uh, we're still having a lot of vehicle thefts, thefts from vehicles, locked, unlocked, and so forth. Um, on this particular page, you can also see that if you go look at response times, um, I put a whole lot of effort in trying to get and keep vehicles in the community of Rossmore. And to actually see something um, kind of jump off the page and, and look at the priority one response times, I know it looks odd that they're the exact same number. I did not manipulate that data. I don't know how that happened, but you can see the compilation of the, of the different numbers. We had 337 calls for service. But the, the priority one response times has, has dropped pretty, uh, pretty considerably. So that's just uh, the effort of the deputies that are working in this community. Uh, to briefly go through um, some of the, the calls, you can talk about going all the way back to July, you'll see uh, you know, residential burglary, uh, three forced entry vehicle burglaries. A lot of these can be attributed to that third row seat in uh, Yukons and Escalades. Um, it's not just here in Rossmore. That is throughout the county has been hit very, very hard with that. <clears throat> um, Garmin GPSs, iPods, um, an assortment of just property crimes. Um, August to, in August, we had four teenagers actually demand money from some uh, another another teenager at Knife Point. Uh, at, and just after uh, 
sundown at uh, the area of uh, Engel and Foster. The loss was $13. I just got off phone, the phone with our investigator to do follow up prior to this meeting. We, we still have not, there just was no additional information whatsoever to go on in that case. Uh, more vehicle burglaries um, throughout the month of, of, of August. I had a, um, a community meeting during the summer over at the Presbyterian Church there um, on Los Sal Boulevard. We had a, a, a lot of people there, um, all concerned about these these property crimes. I, I went through, we, we were there for quite some time and went through a lot of information with them in essentially making their, their property more difficult to take. Um, in, in September, we got some, the, the numbers started to tick down. And overall, I think I'm gonna be up for the year because I had kind of a difficult summer. But I brought in another slide I wanted to show you. And, and since I've been coming here, I've been talking about uh, how these arrests work that you don't have if you've got, you know, here I've got 28 residential burglaries um, thus far in 2011. I don't have 28 burglars and that it... I'll have it. Oh, okay. I just want to get to that one slide. That you typically are going to have an arrest and from that arrest it kind of branches off and you're able to put a lot of other information together. Um, is this thing just loading up? It's taking a while to load. <laughs> okay, <laughs> and I I, pre I apologize. I, ju I just gave this to her right just a couple of moments ago, and I saw it on the screen. Just uh, as I said on October 13th, we had a deputy working, just working the midnight shift, and when everyone else is asleep, you know they're out driving around, and there's not a whole lot to uh, going on you have to pay attention to everything she made a car stop at this individual his last name is lebo and in his car and again it's not sitting there gift wrapped you've got to have some tenacity get into the car do your job as a, as a patrol deputy and was able to find uh stolen property burglary tools uh, a meth pipe and again if you know anything about methamphetamine methamphetamine and, and burglary go hand in hand um, and there was another person in this event that, that we, we didn't get a hold of. Anyway, Mr. Lebo was taken into custody through investigations, we found out that a car theft was associated to his girlfriend up there, a picture of her there. She is a Rossmore resident. Um, through a lot of investigation by Deputy per or Investigator Purser, um, followed up, tracked this, uh, a lot of the property was in this car. You can see um, <coughs> our department, Downey PD, Riverside Sheriff's Department, Garden Grove PD, Westminster PD, all had cases that were related to the property that was found in this car. Girlfriend of the person that we took into custody here was located out in Corona in the stolen car. Corona PD tried to stop her. She took off, was throwing meth and a bunch of other stuff out the window, which is kind of kind of common. So now we've got a recovered stolen vehicle. We've got meth. We've got what was um, turned out to be they were part of an identity theft ring. So now both of them are in custody in two different counties. Vehicles recovered. A bunch of properties recovered. A bunch of meth has been uh, taken into uh, to evidence. And now Investigator Purser has the job of tracking down all of that information. And the reason I kind of laid this out is you can kind of see how interrelated all of this is. So from each one of those pieces of recovered property is another, uh, another crime report, another crime report's associated to that, some DNA is associated with that. So it's just kind of unfolding. And uh, I was very happy. I got a phone call on this one, and the guys were working, um, you know, through the night on it. I came in the morning. Uh, the deputy that made the car stop, I actually had to send her home at 10 o'clock in the morning because she was still working on it, and she'd been there since 6 o'clock the previous night. So my point in all that is 
I've been up here telling these stories for, for a while now that these are how these things work and to see it happen right in front of me was, was, was gratifying and uh, we are, we're putting people as we could call, uh, call it, cops on the dots, trying to put people, uh, keep people in the, in the community of Rossmore. We don't have any time where deputies are heading back to the station and there's no one here. So it's, uh, we're starting to see some results. So. Anybody have any questions of me? Uh, do you attribute the, uh, the, the better, much better response times to, to pretty much always having a vehicle in the area or close to the area? Is, is that what your comments were indicating in terms Absolutely. of? Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, it's... Because it's, those are really phenomenal numbers compared yes. to what they were before. Uh, and it's, to be able to do that, again, it's, uh, there's, I, my supervisors, the sergeants that are working when I'm not on duty, um, you know, I've really impressed upon them and, and kind of, and gotten on them that, it, that sometimes somebody in Rossmore has to leave. You got to, that deputy went back to the jail with all, with these folks. I've got to find another car and move them on over here. In the past, it was just one of those things. Say if the Rossmore deputy went to jail, well, you know, that was part of the deal. So I'm really making an effort to Say I always call it. I make football analogies. It's a, it's like a, it's like pass coverage when you got rotating zones and stuff. You have to keep people moving. You can't have a person leave this area open because there's just there's too many people here, and, and we need to have a deputy. So, um, yeah, and it's just persistence. It's it's paying attention. See, now we're going to expect you to keep replicating the same effort. I know that, but I, you know, I make it one quarter at a time, and I'm, I, I, I'll take a success, and I'll worry about it next quarter. So I think, I think we've got a good, uh, a good recipe, a good formula for it now. We've developed it, um, and you've got some people, and again, I have to give uh, kudos to Henry for this one because he really pushed me to get deputies to stay in here for more than, you know, the period, a, a shift rotation, and the people that have been here have really, uh, you know they're starting to do a really good job and have really taken uh, some ownership in Rossmore. That's excellent. <clears throat> do you have any more information on the third row seating? I was one of the people on Tigertel <laughs> who had it once and then an uh, attempted oh, no. second. How is that investigation going? Because I heard it's not just county, I heard it's... It's everywhere. And the county. thing is, there's no, there's no part numbers on it. There's no way to trace any of it. So that's what makes it... Um, very attractive and it's very lucrative. I didn't realize, I read a report on it about a month or two ago about how much money these guys are getting for these and mm. you know, item for item. Uh, compared to like a stereo or something like that, it's, it's not even close. Yeah, they don't it's, make it's, new seats, so you have to get a refurbished mm -hmm. and the insurance pays for it. But I have a feeling my refurbished seat is probably someone in Michigan their old seat. I think it's... <laughs> They're trading. I, yeah. I have a feeling, yeah. Yeah, I mean, we had an, an incident, and it might even have been yours, where it came out and somebody had, had taken a bike lock and they, they chained their third row seat to their other seats, and they came out and that was hanging partially out of their, out of their vehicle. Because Darn, that's the, what we just started doing. So the person oh. couldn't get it out. Um, wow. Uh, it, it's it, like, like the catalytic converter thing of a couple of years ago. That was yeah. three, four years ago. It's the same type of type of thing, but this is apparently even more lucrative. Okay. If there's no further Question. questions. Let me, let me just okay. ride on Mr. Casey's coattail. Do you attribute the decrease in response time, which we see here to be in half of what we saw in the previous quarter, attributable if at all, to what has taken place in the change of assignments of the former Sunset Beach car and how it now squares with Rossmore, Midway City, or West Ann Island. I, it has to have factored into it, I mean, in some way, but uh, I think the concentration of or to never leaving Rossmore vacant particularly when you see that the low number of response times if you have one bad one in there it distorts you're done it's you're true. done and that was the thing is i i i don't want a bad one we want we want to keep somebody close and last question on the same topic the five recorded priority one calls for the third quarter do you know if 
the five occurred all at night, all during daylight hours, a combination? That I don't know, to be honest with you. I don't, I don't know. Um, I do one, one particular call that's kind of interesting, and that is uh, in the next month's, uh, the next quarter's statistics, which you, you don't have in front of you, you've got 10 vandalisms, and, uh, which is in one month, which is pretty darn high. And they can all be attributed to some egging that was going on, two young girls, uh, went about their Rossmore residence and whatever happened. It was something that happened at Los Al High School. They went and, and, and bought a crate, apparently. You can buy a crate of eggs. They're like 150 eggs or something like that, uh, 300 eggs. It was a huge amount of eggs. And uh, Deputy Geary, who's actually working this evening, um, he put two and two together. There was a license plate associated with one of them. She went to the house. Uh, the girls weren't home, but mom and dad were home. Mom and dad were extremely cooperative, <coughs> called the girl home, and uh, they recovered about 250 of the 300 eggs and uh, put the whole thing to rest. But by doing so, they prevented just a lot of, you know, annoying that is, if you've ever been egged, if your house has ever been oh, yeah. egged, it's just a, it's a <clears throat> real pain. So, and that was just Catherine. It wasn't, it wasn't the crime of the century or anything like that, but she spent a lot of time and a lot of effort just to do the right thing, and, and, and she took care of it. So uh, I called her up and just thanked her for, for, for putting that kind of effort into something which seems kind of trivial, like an egging, but uh, it's trivial until you're the one who gets hit, and it's a pain. So. All right, let's thank you. Okay. Lieutenant, thank you. Thank you. All right, this is the public forum time where any person can address the board on matters which we have jurisdiction. However, if you request any action, know that we would refer it to staff for it to come back and report at a subsequent meeting. So if anyone would like to address the board, please come forward, state your first and last name. And I believe on the podium, there's a piece of paper where you can print your first and last name. So in the event <coughs> we're not able to hear your voice, we can at least <coughs> note who made the comment. I have some pictures here I'd like to share. Uh, do I bring them up to the- can you Give us your name, sir, and we'll start- My forward. name is uh, Ralph Epstein. I reside in- uh, Rossmore for about 10 years now. And I have a, a little problem. I, like, I guess I need help from the board to, to fix for me. Uh, I have a tree in front of my house and it um, gives off these little pieces of whatever. Um, I guess they're buds or whatever and they're, they're very uh, uh, nuisance. They cause a lot of damage to my vehicles and the uh, uh, sidewalk gets littered with this, the street gets littered with this, and it's just a problem that um, I think that the tree needs to be replaced. And we've asked for the tree to be replaced, and we've been told that we have to come to the board to request this. So that's what I'm doing. Um, I'm coming to the board. I've got some pictures of what this tree <coughs> does um, that I'd like to share. So. Do I just bring them up? You want to give Mr. Tab a lot of pictures and no, I'll take it. I'll take a look at that. And you're on what street again? Uh, Oak No. Oak No. Mm -hmm. If I recall, um, uh, normally when you make a request to the district, someone will come out and take a look at that. Have they have they done that? Um, well, I believe. I believe they have. I'm not sure. Someone did um, go and visit. Mr. President, members of the board, uh, when we receive any kind of a service request regarding a tree, we create a service order. That service order then is handled by Randy um, Reynolds, who is your tree consultant, who will go out and inspect the tree and come back and give me his appraisal of the situation. We've had two complaints in a recent past of trees that were dropping uh, stuff on, onto their cars, driveways, uh, sidewalks, etc. And the trees were deemed to be mature and healthy. Now- Including this gentleman's tree? I, I, I don't know. I, I believe the, that is, because that's what we heard. We heard the same information. That your tree was healthy and mature and not diseased. Right, and defective. they don't want to remove it because- Short of the droppings, but it's not structurally defective. Right. And per your policy, uh, Mr. President, um, that is not a reason for removing a healthy tree. And 
I will say that we no longer plant trees that do this kind of stuff. Uh, we have identified those trees that are not the, the most uh, resident friendly. And as those trees uh, are removed for either dead, diseased, or some other factor, we will replace them with trees that do not drop stuff on people's property or their vehicles. The difficulty that you have here is that if you were to undertake the removal of a specific tree for a specific resident, I can tell you that at least in the one case that I'm very familiar with, there's 325 of those trees in this community. Taking out that, you know, and if you do that for one resident, then you're kind of obligated to do it for every other resident. And pretty soon you're really looking not just at the cost factor of replacing 300 and some trees, but also the fact that these are mature trees which are take years and years to get to that state. So your policy, uh, going back as far as I can, as the, during, since the establishment of this board, has been not to remove a healthy tree. Uh, the only remedy available to a resident is to file a damage claim if they feel that their property has been damaged and we would run that through the board and through our insurance carrier and see, if the, 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 see what the, comes of that process. We don't encourage that because typically uh, that doesn't result in an outcome of removing the tree. This tree that we, we currently have has been there for maybe four or five years. It's a, it is an actual replacement for the tree that w was there that caused damage to our sewer system. So they pulled that other tree out, put this one in, and at, at the time, we did make this, the request. So we've made requests throughout this whole period. So there was an opportunity to replace this tree prior to this point. So it's a five-year-old tree, and unfortunately it's Basically. a species that has a lot of droppings. Exactly. Yeah, I, I, th I think though the policy is gonna, what we're gonna have to adhere to, at least from my point of view, given that it's not structurally defective. <clears throat> okay, well then we'll be putting in claims and go that route then. Thank That's you. the process, and I thank you for informing us. Anyone else this evening? Well, the name of that tree is a liquid amber, and there are lots of them planted in Rossmore. I, I don't know what to tell the man to do, but I know it's a, a pain in the neck because it does uh, drop a lot of things that c could be dangerous, especially if you step on them. But uh, be that as it may, it's a pretty tree. It has very nice foliage in the fall. But I'm not here to talk about the trees. I'm talking about Mr. Coletta's behavior to one of our citizens' last meeting. And I would hope that you recognize your error and apologize to this man. I think his name is Al Parishall. He asked you a simple question regarding the analysis that Mr. Tabwoda said he was going to do. He asked you if it was going to be on the website. And instead of giving him a simple yes or no, as you would require, because you're a prosecutor, you know that that's what the answer should have been, or I don't know. You launched into a, a little tirade about what was going to be on. And then when the gentleman said, I didn't understand, instead of explaining it to him or giving him the correct answer, you said, oh, you've done this before. Now, I wasn't here, but I saw it on television, and I think your behavior was abominable. I was going to write an article about it, but Mrs. Parashall said she'd take care of it in a letter to the editor. And um, I really wish you would apologize to the man, because I think he deserves an apology. And Mr. Maynard, this is a not a political forum for you to tell people to vote, not to vote for, Mayor Pro Tem Edgar, as he's a Republican, okay? This is not a forum for politics. Mr. Edgar happens to represent Los Alamitos very well and doesn't discuss Republican or Democrat. 
and I don't think you should either. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Bloom. Anyone else? And by the way, is that analysis going to be on the website, Mr. Tapwata? It is on the website. It, it is on the website, yes. Your analysis. Yes, my analysis. Thank you. Anyone else? All right, seeing none, then we'll move forward to the reports to the board. Mr. Chabot, the first one this evening, would you, would you like to address D1? Mr. President, members of the board, uh, this is the audit committee reporting on the district's fiscal year 2010-2011 annual audit report, which is actually a report of, uh, of the previous year. Uh, the committee met and discussed the report at length. Uh, we shared with the report the management letter, and that was discussed as well. We also shared with the committee the changes from the previous audit to the current audit, and we discussed that with, uh, I believe, satisfactory explanation to the committee. Uh, we also shared with the committee part of the problem associated with cash flow as part of the audit process because we, uh, we receive our, our general fund revenue from the county, that's tax revenue, during the months of primarily December and April. And uh, we provided the committee with a bar chart showing the radical uh, changes in revenue from the low months to the high months and used that as an explanation for a recommendation in the first management letter that we received that we set aside a, uh, two months of, uh, of cash flow uh, in, our, in our general fund account to account for those uh, fluctuations. And it becomes very apparent when you see that bar chart that two months of cash flow uh, are not sufficient to uh, uh, balance out, if you will, the low and the high months in the revenue stream. So we respectfully uh, disagreed with the, with the auditor and indicated that we used our uh, LAIF account as a leveler, which is partly an investment, but it's a very liquid investment that allows us to use cash to pay our bills on a monthly basis without having to borrow money. And uh, the auditor, I think, was satisfied with that, uh, with that explanation. And we agreed that to the extent that we could uh, manage our general fund account uh, in a more, uh, shall we say, uh, balanced way that uh, we would attempt to do that. Uh, Mr. Brad Wilder, Wilder <laughs> Brad is here from RAMS, the accounting firm that conducts the audit. And uh, with your permission, I'd ask him to uh, come to the podium and to make a presentation as he did for the audit committee and review this audit document with you. It's Wilbur, right? Willibur. Willibur. Good evening, Mr. President and members of the board. Good evening, sir. My name is Brad Wellaber. I'm representing the firm Rogers, Anderson, Mowley, and Scott. We are your independent auditors. And a few weeks ago, I met with the members of the audit committee, directors Coletta and Maynard, and we discussed in detail the contents of the audit report, as uh, General Manager <clears throat> Tabwada has already mentioned, which you should have a copy in, in front of you. And if you were to look in that report on page one, this is the independent auditor's report. And in this letter here, it's the opinion letter, and we're issuing an opinion that's called an unqualified opinion, which means there's no qualifications. It's the highest level of assurance that we can provide under the standards for a financial statement audit. Uh, in this, we're saying that uh, we believe, based on our audit evidence that we've examined, that there are no material misrepresentations in the information that you have in your hands. Um, I'm not gonna go into detail of the different pages because we've already covered that with the audit committee. Unless you have any specific questions, I would be more than happy to uh, discuss those. And uh, also in addition to the financial statements that you have, uh, we provided two letters. Uh, one, communicating any significant audit findings to you. And uh, the second, the management letter that um, Manager Tabwada has already mentioned to you in our recommendation about uh, establishing a fund balance policy that would be in accordance with GASB 54.
Well, I'm not sure if this question's for you or uh, Mr. Tabuada, uh, but when, in terms of the balancing, I think we were talking n not just about using LAFE for that, but establishing, I think, what we called a rainy day fund of, of some kind was, did we decide we were going to do that by increasing the amount we might leave in lay for, I believe this was addressed about three or four months ago and memory doesn't serve me and my notes didn't either in terms of decisions that were made in regard to that issue. Director Casey of uh, Gatsby 54 requires that government set aside what they call a rainy day fund. It is not specific as to where you place those funds. This board adopted a policy of placing $250,000 in that rainy day fund, meaning that your fund balance in, uh, in your reserves would never drop below that point. And so uh, all that is, that's an accounting procedure, not, uh, it doesn't really, you could have that in a liquid investment, you could have it in cash, you could have it in your fund balance and fund 10, as long as it's designated as a restricted reserve that is solely for the purposes of an emergency rainy day fund, that satisfies the, uh, the, uh, the requirement. Uh, Brad, if you. Sure, um, we provided a letter back in, I believe it was February, February, February correct. that gave a lot of details about how you could go about adopting a fund balance policy that would be in accordance with GASB 54. There's a lot of details that we wouldn't want to get into tonight, and establishing a fund balance policy um, takes a bit of work because you have to decide as a board and as a district where uh, you want to do certain reserves, commitments, or assignments to certain types of balances. If you're taking on a particular capital improvement project, for example, you can commit funds to that project, mm -hmm. and then um, it is required to be used for that purpose uh, because you as the highest level of authority over the district have voted that, and the only way it could be undone would be for you to unvote that. Uh, so there's different levels of um, assignments that you can make basically uh, with that policy and this rainy day fund that's uh, been mentioned here uh, there's no magic number that's going to be what's the perfect amount that's right you really have to decide on a you know government by government basis what's appropriate for you and one of those things that we looked at at the end of the audit committee meeting um, shared by your accountant was the cash flow and that would certainly be something you would want to look at when you're developing a fund balance policy is the timing of that because there's two months out of the year where you see receive most of your revenue and certainly you need to uh, manage that cash flow to meet your other obligations throughout the year yeah, I don't need any more detail in terms of you know, going into everything else about it. it that's clear enough in terms of uh, purposes of what I need to know. Okay. Great. And uh, the, other, the other question I have was on uh, page 27 of the document. And I, it's, the, uh, it's toward the bottom, other financing sources and uses. And the original uh, budgeted transfers in was uh, 80, 89,700. And as I recall, we didn't need all of that because there was a, a project or something about one of the projects that we were not going to require uh, the funds so that we only needed 20,000 of the original budgeted amount. Is that, is that a correct statement in terms of my memory on that? Or, or do you recall? Director Casey, I believe that that we had projected a, a fund transfer into um, into the budget to account for projects that would move money from Fund 10 into Fund 40 to do that's what I projects. recall also. So what all that we moved in was 20,000, which right. was the amount that was available to the district for the management of the Rush Park Bond Fund fund. 20 fund 20 so money moved from fund uh, 20 to fund 10 to fund 40 and so we only moved the 10 the 20,000 as opposed to the bigger number right uh, yep fair enough uh, that that's all I have the, the document uh, uh, from my review uh, everything looks fine No comments from anyone? All right, on this matter, Mr. Talbot, this evening, are you re 
recommend we just receive the report, or are you also accept asking us to approve this by uh, motion? Yes, sir. Receive the report of the audit committee, approve the fiscal year 2010-2011 annual audit report, and receive the management letter. Should anyone like to make that motion? So motioned. Second. Any further discussion tonight? No. Nothing further? All right. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Anyone opposed, please say nay. All right. The motion is passed. Thank you, sir, for doing a great job, as you have in previous years. I, I, you made it very, um, you facilitated quite well the audit meeting we had by answering our dumb questions and <laughs> taking us back pleasure. and forth from page to page and having, having that you in the room to trace where those numbers are really facilitated. So I appreciate your uh, support. Well, you're most welcome. Thank you very much. <clears throat> now we move to a D2, Mr. Tabwater. Mr. President, members of the board, I'm going to walk you through this report on governance because there's been quite a bit of activity. And rather than uh, do this in ex an extemporaneous fashion, I'm going to read you the report because uh, uh, the community, I think, uh, needs to hear what has been uh, going on with re regards to governance. At your board meeting in October, you received a report from the general manager regarding a shared services case study dated June 18, 2011, undertaken on behalf of Orange County LAFCO. The study examined potential cost savings by consolidation of Rossmore with Los Alamitos and Seal Beach. The study was critiqued by the general manager who reported that there were findings based on assumptions, extrapolations, and in some cases, inaccurate data, some of which was taken from previous documents such as the 2008 comprehensive fiscal analysis relating to incorporation. At your special board meeting on October 25th, you authorized the general manager to engage the services of Harvey M. Rose, LLC, a highly regarded accounting firm capable of forensic accounting the engagement at this time was limited to an analysis of the case study as it relates to the comparative data between Rossmore and the county, and that analysis is underway. Concurrently, the district submitted letters dated October 6, 2011 to Supervisor slash LAFCO Commissioner John Morlock, requesting financial data regarding to his often stated position that Rossmore was a $600,000 drain on the county and that the assumption of additional latent powers by the district would not pencil out. The letter is attached as, a, as an attachment to this report. To date, the only response to that letter has been from LAFCO, signed by Carolyn Emery, Assistant Executive Officer of LAFCO. The letter, dated October 13, 2011, states that the case study represents the most f uh, recent fiscal data collection for the Rossmore community and the neighboring cities of Los Alamitos and Seal Beach. This is, of course, unresponsive in terms of the data requested by the district, and that letter is also <clears throat> attached. As recently as April 16, 2011, Supervisor Morlock was quoted in Patch.com stating, and I quote, Rossmore community leaders are going to get exactly what they're asking for, Orange County Supervisor said this week. Another quote, quote states, a a firm is in the process of compiling a report on Rossmore for the county's local agency for formation commission, LAFCO, which should be ready in the next couple of weeks. Well, that's the case study. Then on October 6, 2011, OC 180 News reports, one reason cited by Morlock from Orange County to get rid of Rossmore is based on financial data, which at one time apparently indicated that Rossmore was a financial drain on the county. But new analysis doesn't support that idea, and Morlock seems to be backing away from the financial argument in favor of last tangi tangible good governance reasons to rid the county of Rossmore. Supervisor Morlock's chief of staff, Rick Francis, is also quoted in that article in response to the question, OC 180 News, is the analysis on cons consolidation case study now considered complete by your office? Mr. Francis responds, there, there may very well be other areas of consolidation to explore. However, we do not have current plans to request further information or analysis. But perhaps the most compelling statement in our article is the editor's opinion as follows. As far as we know, none of this cost benefit of the taking of the Rossmore Shopping Center has actually been calculated, but it seems inevitable that annexation of the corner will reduce property tax revenue to the RCSD without a similar cost reduction, 
and this is a compelling reason not to do it. This speaks volumes about the need for financial data to justify any initiatives toward Rossmore. Since the county and or LAFCO seem to be backing away from generating additional financial reports regarding Rossmore, specifically, the only data available for the district's analysis is predicated on a consolidation of the three entities, <coughs> which is considered a non-starter. There are, however, specific conclusions in the case study which needs to be analyzed from a specialized accounting perspective, which could lead to a more thorough analysis of yet to be obtained data from the county. The question may be asked, why pursue data which appears not to be forthcoming? The most basic yet altogether important reason is that the city of Los Alamitos and Supervisor Morlock have not backed away from pursuing the annexation of the Rossmore Shopping Center. Without data to support the wisdom of the county's foregoing several hundreds, th hundreds of thousands of dollars in sales and property tax revenue, there is no justification for continuing this endeavor, particularly without any tangible evidence of fiscal benefit to either party. Moreover, this district is still burdened with the uncertainty of a positive outcome in the pursuit of additional latent powers. Until and if there is a definitive statement from Supervisor Morlock that no further data will be generated and that Rossmore can pursue its own destiny without a threat or interference, it would be imprudent to believe that the pursuit of a comprehensive analysis of, the count of county fiscal data is unnecessary. The analysis of the case study is a first step in those pursuits. Also, the submission of application to LAFCO for additional latent powers is pending further resolution of receipt and analysis of county financial data and further due diligence. That's my report, uh, Mr. President. I stand ready to answer questions. Right. Does anyone from the board have questions? You're just asking us to receive the report then? Uh, yes, sir, if, uh, if there are no questions. All right, if there's been no questions, then we'll just receive the report. At the consensus <clears throat> of the board? Yep. Okay. Uh, fair enough. Thank you for the update. And we move to the consent calendar. Do, does anyone of the directors here tonight wish to pull any one of the items? Uh, actu actually, I want to pull item uh, three, quarterly status report. <clears throat> Mr. Chavarro, you want to address uh, item E3, the quarterly status report? Or, you, yeah, or, do, you, I just, or do you want a motion on the rest of it, or do you want to well, just... Well, let's wait till this is right. completed. Yeah. Yeah. What is your question, Director Casey? Uh, I have questions on, very simple questions on two items. All right. Uh, the, the first of which uh, con uh, concerns the, uh, the many, many sites are... Uh, reservations that, that are now available that they can be used and the statement is is that without adding a rest restroom uh, that the sites are not that desirable I guess my qu my first question is would it be fiscally feasible to if we could generate some revenues from the mini parks to possibly add a restroom or this would that seem to make any sense uh, Director Casey, the, the capital cost for installing a restroom would be substantial. I would think so. And uh, I don't think there's any amount of reservations that would uh, pencil out, if you will, uh, to offset that capital cost. The other issue, of course, is that you don't own the land. The land is, the land is owned mm -hmm. by uh, the, what is it, Golden State Water Company, who leases it to us for a dollar a year. and. They were reluctant when we had the issue of the, uh, help me, uh, Director Coletta, the Verizon. Oh, yeah, the hubs. The hubs that were the hubs installed. That, uh -huh. yeah, and, yeah, yeah. and Verizon wanted to establish a, a, a easement just to put a box in that park. And uh, yeah. Golden State basically said, we're not interested in adding any other infrastructure to our current property. So I, I, I don't see that as a feasible um, uh, project. Uh, I only made, make mention of it because um, we don't get reservation requests for it, even though people do use it. 
um, but not on a reserve basis. So since basically we're getting it for a dollar, it's just like first come, first satisfied in terms of using these facilities. If someone wants a facility that They can just come on down and use it. Correct. Okay. Okay, that's the first item. And I have one, one other item on, uh, it's on the uh, there's page Web. numbers. There's page numbers at the bottom. Oh, I'm sorry. It's on. Well, it says 96 of 128. If that helps you. Okay. Okay. So that does help. All right. I didn't mention that number. I thought. Uh, anyway, uh, it it says our website is currently being upgraded, which I understand, and it should go on in, in online in the next quarter. And I use that website myself frequently. I hope other community members do also, and. Anytime I go in there, I'm always able to go through different pages or information very easily. It's very friendly. So in terms of the upgrade, is it supposed to make it more user friendly or is it something that's going to be more efficient? Or I can't remember the reasons that we need to update that website, which seems to be fine now. Well, the primary reason is the board asked us to. We did. Yes. <laughs> and and Mikey likes it. Well, the reason I think is that website design has has really taken off. And uh, if you if you go through our surrounding communities and look at their websites, they're they're becoming interactive. They're they have uh, they have uh, what do you call it, Liz? Uh, pictures that. Well, why don't you tell them what? Um, Basically, our, our new website will be, I can show you the link to it, and you're welcome to browse through it and let me know what you think before it actually goes live. Okay. And I'd really appreciate that, any of you who want to look at the link. Sure, I'll do that. Now's the time to, you know, give your input. Right. Um, yeah, let me know what it is, and I'll definitely do it. People are, are getting their, their information now on mobile devices, tablets. Right. And our website just it isn't equipped for that. It doesn't have the content that it should for a government agency. And... I think when you see what we're working on, um, you'll be pleased with the result. And you know, we, you're welcome to give your input. I mean, yeah, as you know, well. If as it as seems well. too difficult to get around, feel free to tell me. <laughs> okay. Well, uh, well, thank you so much. That's uh, all I have. That answers the question very satisfactorily. All right. Let's uh, since we pulled E3, why don't we uh, get a motion on that with your qualification? Your motion that we approve. Consent item E3. I motion that we approve consent item E3. Anyone would like to second it? Second. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? No one opposed. Uh, with regards to items E1, 2, 4, 5, and 6, is there a motion to approve the balance of the consent calendar? So motioned. Second. Thank you. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. Consent calendar is approved. We have no public hearing and no resolutions, and now we go to the regular calendar. Mr. Tabawada, would you address H1, please? Mr. President, members of the board, uh, as you may recall, uh, back in 2008, I believe, 2007, 2008, we undertook a process of negotiating an MOU among the district, <clears throat> the uh, girls softball league, and members of the community. Uh, and established a th three-year uh, memorandum of understanding, which for the first time uh, really uh, addressed the issue of the number of games that were played at, Ross at uh, Rossmore Park on Saturdays. So spring ball was covered in this agreement, and the number of games were reduced substantially during that three-year period. At the end of that three-year period, uh, we had experienced uh, different issues that were raised by community members that were not covered by that agreement. So we set out, first of all, to identify all of the past, uh, not MOUs, but agreements and board approved uh, uh, actions that related to LAGSL. And we then set out to incorporate all of those into a wall-to-wall -wall comprehensive document that took into account not just spring ball, but fall ball, the, the all-star tournament uh, deal dealt with things like 
practices and friendlies and scrimmages and all of the other issues that tend to come up with with regard to a baseball season that is for is for the most part almost year round except for the summer and the winter break so uh, this board established a committee of uh, director rips uh, myself and uh, super, uh, recreation superintendent um, Emily um, Gingras and uh, she set out to create a document that incorporated all of those past ag agreements and also everything that was had been raised as issues uh, within the, the previous three years. We then asked the, uh, the LAGSL to select a committee of three individuals to be represent their interest in this uh, process. And we asked the community to select three people from a number of people that, con that convened at a, at a preliminary meeting to talk about the process. And so that committee, those three committees were established. We then met uh, for about six or seven months uh, on a regular basis, exchanging uh, proposals and ideas and, and dealing with, with every aspect of, of, of the impact to that, uh, to that community from the activity level of the LAGSL from their uh, baseball play. We winnowed down all of those uh, issues down to the agreement that's in front of you. Uh, it was uh, an exhaustive process, but it was collaborative. At times it was, uh, you know, it got a little heated, but then that's to be expected when people are trying to uh, achieve their desired result. I always look at a negotiation that is successful is when everyone walks away thinking they didn't get everything they wanted, but got a lot of what they wanted. And I believe that the last session uh, that we had uh, consensus from the parties that were present at that, uh, at that last meeting, that we had achieved what was a, a, a document that was comprehensive, understood, easy to understand, and one that could, uh, would lead hopefully to uh, a better relationship between the users of the park and the uh, surrounding community. So that document before you, and uh, which we request your approval, uh, is, uh, is, I think, a, a product of a successful negotiation. There are, I think, representatives in the audience from the, uh, both the uh, LAGSL and from the uh, neighborhood group uh, who may want to address you on this, uh, on this, on this item. Um, I think it's, a, it's, it's quite an achievement, and I think that uh, Director Rips really carried uh, this thing to a, a good conclusion, and uh, one is it's one that I am proud to bring to you uh, as uh, as a document for your approval. Thank you. Do we want to start out with the board, or should we hear from the audience, if at all? Well, there's I think there's members from the. All right. Uh, if anyone would like to comment on the document. Um, I imagine you have it. It's um, on the on the web, I believe, isn't it, Mr. Tabwater? Sir, is the material tonight that's up for discussion here? This agenda item H one is it on the web? Is it posted? No, sir, because it's not re not received your approval. Okay. Mm. All right. So this would be your first impression looking at it, sir. Good evening. Hi, I'm Van Zaitz. Oh, it, excuse me. It is in the agenda package. So yes, it is. Uh, <laughs> President Coletta, uh, members of the board. I was the lead negotiator for the Rossmore Park neighbors, and I want to extend my thank to Henry, Emily, and especially Director Rips, um, whose leadership uh, shown in this. Um, I, I'm indebted to his character and that he brought to the table and his even hand. I think he, I can speak for myself and I think for the team, he has earned a, a great deal of respect from the Rossmore Park neighbors. Could you um, put the microphone just a little closer? There. there we go. I encourage the RCSD to uh, approve this MOU. It is um, the best that can be done given the constraints. Um, it essentially maintains the status quo. I, on the first evening of negotiations, was taken aback and surprised that one of the ground rules was that park policy was off the table. 
It could not be altered, cannot be changed, cannot be discussed. One board member could not negotiate, change the park policy that is uh, to the board's responsibility. So this MOU had, uh, from my point of view at the very beginning, what I perceived was an artificial limitation in any kind of success. So given that ground rule that there are no policy changes, then this is indeed the best MOU that we could create. This MOU, in no way, shape, or form, addresses the issues that the Rossmore Park neighbors have to be, have consistently brought to this board year after year. It does not um, address them whatsoever. It maintains status quo, and um, it's better than nothing, so again, I encourage you to approve it. The uh, existing park policy is the heart of the issue. Um, I heard my parking analysis. I backed it up with data facts. We have, as Rossmore Park neighbors, more than a decade's worth of data behind us. And I can stand here and tell you that this park can have games in the morning and in the afternoon, and the entire middle part of the day can be given to the Rossmore residents to use. It would completely clear the park to allow for afternoon games. The league is down over 30% in membership, enrollment, and yet there's not one Saturday game reduction in the park. Zero. What do you I, attribute that to? Excuse me? What do you attribute that to? You have a dance card, and you can fill the dance card. And if you voluntarily give gaps, which I think in their heart they would want to do, but as soon as they do, you're going to have a traveling team from Bakersfield put a, a permit in front of him, and he will sign it because park policy requires him to. It's valid, they get insurance, they're willing to pay, he will sign it, he has no limitation. The park policy needs to change to give him the guidelines to make the rules that would make the park an enjoyable place for all of the Rossmore residents to use. Um, anyone who says that we can't achieve that morning games and afternoon games. Needs to bring data to this board. I am more than willing to bring all the data that proves otherwise. I asked repeatedly through this process for data. I received <coughs> no data from the other side. We were the only ones that brought spreadsheets, data, facts, figures, usage, games played per team, how they've grown over the years to fill the dance card. When your enrollment's down and you're still playing the same amount of games at the park, then you're playing more games per team. Um, okay, so at the last board meeting, um, Director Kaler discussed the Seal Beach City Council plan to change the uh, zoning. And he had a rally, a call to rally for all the Rossmore residents to <clears throat> stand up for the people in St. Cloud and Montecito. They're gonna be impacted by parking, congestion, and, and the crime that comes with congestion and people. And I commend him for that, and it was a good call, but I want the same respect. We've been asking for a call to arms from this board for years. We don't want to have that same thing that they are gonna be getting facing in St. Clouds, and you control my destiny as a homeowner, not Seal Beach City Council. So I, I'm just asking for the same respect that we would want to give the St. Cloud people and I would appreciate your consideration on that. So in closing, I would like to encourage you to approve the MOU. It is a good foundation for a start point. It is not what I consider an end point. I think we need some leadership from this board to address the issue that is you've been hearing for year after year after year. You've experienced it. Anybody that has come up to that park on a Saturday in the spring has to park a block and a half away to even <clears throat> approach the park. That's just not right for a residential community. This is not a sports arena. The city of Compton has better location and layout and impact to their people than we do. We're a little closed community around a park and you just cannot have a sports arena <laughs> mentality when you're dealing with a residential community such as ours. I appreciate your consideration. I do, uh, would appreciate your approval of the MOU today. Um, and I look forward to someone in the board leading a charge to 
reviewing the park policy, reviewing what can be done, taking some bold leadership steps on relieving the congestion and traffic that we've been dealing with for many, many years. Thank you for your consideration. <clears throat> Good evening, board, and good evening, Henry. Um, my name is Natanya Sutherland, and I am a member of the LAGSL board. And I was also a member of this MOU meeting committee. We've been meeting every two weeks since May of this year. And I would really strongly urge each and every one of you to adopt this document that we worked so hard to put together. This is in you know everyone's best interest and I want to thank Jeffrey Ripps the director and Henry and Emily for all your time and effort for attending the meetings every two weeks with along with the rest of us and that's all I have to say thank you thank you ma'am <clears throat> Hi, my name is Ralph Artabadian. Um I live on the park, on Rossmore Park. Um, I've been involved in uh, negotiating issues involving the park with the league for many years now. Um, some of you I've known for many years. Um, I urge you also to uh, adopt this uh, agreement. Um, it's not a perfect agreement, but I do believe that uh, it brings some benefit uh, to the neighborhood and it uh, does not damage the LAGSL. Um, having been involved in this a long time and, and seen many efforts to um, mitigate the situation, I, I came to the uh, understanding a long time ago that to improve the conditions and address some of the problems we have, we couldn't do it by damaging LAGSL. Um, I recognize in the document before you recognizes on the part of the neighborhood that this is a good organization that serves a very good purpose um, and uh, I believe that so on the other hand we do want to address some of the problems we have and through the years I've realized doing it by damaging the league isn't the right way and this document is one step in that direction um, you've heard from LAGSL they support it we support it it has a pathway um, doesn't guarantee will get there, but it, it creates a pathway to some of the more ambitious things that we were trying to do. And I believe that pathway will help the neighborhood and will be able, maybe even help the league, but it certainly won't damage the league. So I think it's a good document in, in that way. It um, will continue to depend on Henry's leadership uh, to see it through to the end and on this board. So I do want to thank Henry for all the hours uh, he put in uh, over at the Rossmore Park Community Center and, and Jeff as well. And I know Jeff's time is very valuable to him and it's everybody's time is valuable to them. So I do uh, want to thank, uh, thank you for, for doing it and I'm available to help answer any questions and, and so is Van, thanks. Ralph, I do have a question for you. Okay. Since you were the signatory on the first measure yeah. of understanding, and now you've been involved with this one, in your own words, what are the highlights and the new benefits of this measure of understanding that you and your neighbors are receiving? Right. Well, that's a good question. I put out a, I knew that the 34 homeowners around the park weren't going to read the whole document, so I put, tried to summarize that in about one paragraph. I think the key changes is that it maintains the spring season pretty much as it is now. Um, it does reduce one Saturday of practice uh, in January. That's a Saturday that had been added since the last agreement. So there was this creep issue that we were trying to pull the, pull the league's usage back to where it was in 2007. Um, it also uh, reduces by three Saturdays of practice the fall season, but it leaves just as many games. It reduces uh, Sunday play. Two Sundays in, uh, a year were allocated to make up games. 
those games don't go away, they just get shifted to the weekdays. But I think that's a benefit because um, many casual users of the park will want to use the park on Sundays. Um, th there are many technical agreements in it that um, plug loopholes. And one example of that is um, at some point in the last few years, I noticed that there was a game when there wasn't supposed to be a game. And, and it was explained, well, that's a scrimmage. It's not a game. I said, well, gee, the girls are wearing uniforms. There's umpires and there's spectators. Why isn't that a game? If uh, It's just exactly the same as a game. I thought, if that's not a game, then there are no limits on games. So it, it addresses that. So there are many technical issues. There's not a huge dramatic reduction in the number of games, but it creates a ceiling. And most importantly, to what Van was trying to do, it creates a pathway to get us to the point where we would have a Saturday reduction and really get some meaningful um, uh, benefit on the traffic and parking and noise situations. I hope that helps. That does. Thank you. Yeah. Um, first of all, I, I do want to uh, commend the participants on both sides. Um, everybody's mentioned the meetings went on for several months, and there clearly was give and take and, and compromise, and at times we were taking the proverbial two steps forward, one step back, or one step forward, two steps back. Um, but at the end, we did come up with an agreement that I think is, is a, a good agreement. I think there was some understanding that, that also happened um, that the league really understood some of the challenges that the, the residents are going through on a week by week basis and, and year by year they understood a little bit better about the concept of creep and how it's moved forward um, and I think the, the the residents also spoke about and understood the importance that the league has for the community and that that, that, that plays in the girls lives um, for me a couple of things that stood out in here at least, uh, one of the most important things for me is that part of this MOU says that the league and the district and the neighborhood are going to meet twice a year to keep communication going, keep, keep dialogue going. And that's more, I mean, the participants all committed to doing that. And there was a their understanding of the challenge of, you know, within the LAGSL, the president leaves every couple of years, and so who's the next person kind of be on, going to be coming in? Um, so you never know if that dialogue is going to continue. But here it's, it's committed, and the district is committed to saying that we are going to get together twice a year to continue the conversations um, uh, that have started at, at this place. I agree that this is a beginning. Uh, we talked about um, things, and I felt the frustration as as people did that we we couldn't make some decisions. But I committed to to the neighbors and to the league that there's some things that we're going to take to their capital improvements committee, which has taken place in two weeks. Correct. Right. So that conversation is going to start, and and Henry and I both committed at the beginning that we would be looking at the policies and reviewing the policies. This MOU was not to change the policies, but that we wanted to look at those, and there are things that we have to address within those. So the policies are going to be looked at. Now, as I stated in there, I was one person, and I cannot speak on behalf of the board, and that has to go through the, po the process and procedures that it goes through. But it is something that we have to look at. And, and you presented you know, some great statistics and a great presentation last time about the parking issues and challenges there. And we have to take those under consideration and say, what, you know, what can we do as a board? What's within our purview to, to do within the board, as a board to make changes there if possible? So is it perfect, as everybody said? No. But I think it's, it's, there's a good understanding, a good agreement. Um, and and I, th I think, as I said in the beginning, I commend the participants because it really was um, some good, honest uh, conversation back and forth. And frustration showed. But um, I think that this is a, a document that can be signed by all parties, be proud of, and know and have an understanding that it is a beginning and not an end. Uh, yeah, a couple things. First of all, I, I was quite impressed that uh, the three agencies of the RPN, the RCSD, and LAGSL came together. And from my looking at the document, I was well, very impressed with, with what they did, and I commend you for that. And then I'm hearing that uh, from a lot of the neighbors around the park that maybe it's just and I agree, it's just a start, but in a sense, uh, just a, a, a and everything's a compromise when you're talking about three different groups. But and even though I th 
I approve of this myself, it seems like there's still a lot of uh, dissatisfaction in the sense that the park policies were not part of this, nor should they be without the board coming forward. So I, for one, am okay <clears throat> with maybe having an agenda item to look at the policies with an open mind and uh, perhaps, you know, see what we might decide in terms of any cha changes, if any. And an another thing that I, I was thinking, it's sort of change of course, that with using Rush Park for, I think they were what, it says 6U and 8U, that is, that's six and under and eight and under, I guess, for, Correct. for games at, at uh, one game at Rush Park. I, sort of a question and a comment. Does that take away any games that are in the new schedule at Rossmore Park, or is that just giving the uh, 6U and 8U a chance to play at a, at a park in Rossmore? Director Casey, when Field 1 at Rush Park was first uh, built out uh, to its current uh, condition, uh, it was done so with the uh, idea that we would move, LAGSL would move uh, games from R Rossmore Park to Rush Park. From a conceptual point of view, that made all the sense in the world. But what was lost in that, in that concept was that the young girls, six under and eight under, were going to be playing in a vacuum with regard to their older uh, sisters, if you will, playing at Rossmore Park, where the, you know, where the they were the they're the feeders for the for the older groups, and we're not going to be exposed to what goes on the activity level, the camaraderie, the snack sure. shack, all of those things that are that are part and parcel of playing at at Rossmore Park. Also, the field was not configured uh, sufficiently to make it. Uh, attractive for use by others. For instance, uh, the, the, this part of the discussion uh, during the MOU process was, well, could we, could we upgrade this field so that we could have a mix of six U's, eight U's, 10 U's, 12 U's, what have you, so that you could rotate the younger girls through uh, Rossmore and Rush Park and still have part of that experience. So those are all things that uh, we're going to take up. The the rush uh, field one at Rush Park is going to be part of the CIP discussion. Uh, we certainly I saw that. Yeah. We, we certainly are going to uh, do our research with regard to our policies and try to balance the uh, the use of parks with the availability of parks for use. Uh, no community anywhere in this area has an abundance of fields available for use. It's, it's, uh, it is a mad scramble for all kinds of different leagues, soccer, lacrosse, softball, baseball, f football, you name it. Everyone's competing for that green space. Unfortunately, Rossmore only has two eight-acre parks. And if you were to take any measure of what is the standard acreage per, per uh, population, we are woefully short of open space in this community. And so when you look at the use of the park and the demand for the park and uh, how you balance those, those two needs, that's where the, the, the board is gonna have to uh, very thoughtfully look at any policy changes that we bring forward. And I won't bring you any policy changes, uh, recommendations, until they're totally researched and that there uh, is uh, a valid justification for the recommendation. That doesn't mean you won't get them, it just means that we're gonna take our time to develop these to try and, and bring to you a balance of need and availability. Yeah, because I can tell now, just based on this quality agreement, that uh, you're, so, you're all sort of on a roll in terms of the way things are going. So uh, from that, I would hope that, you know, we don't stop there. And at least since it's an open dialogue and maybe hopefully friendlier now, I don't, I know you said there was a lot of consternation, et cetera, which I'm not surprised, but I, from what I can see, we got to keep going. So anyway, that's all I have to say on this. 
I have a couple questions. Um, reading the preamble, and, and by the way, I, I know that this has been a, a long going process <clears throat> right here. And I know that part of the preamble and the intent is to reduce noise, traffic congestion, and litter. That's in your preamble first paragraph. And obviously, reducing games reduces noise, reduces traffic congestion. But in the preamble, I didn't see anything really attacking the litter situation. <clears throat> Has it been discussed what the uh, girls softball league can do in between games or what can be done to help control litter? That's not an issue that was brought forth at, at, that I can recall ever being brought to our attention <clears throat> other than at times uh, when there was a, a, a large activity, let us say, let's say the carnival, where you have hundreds of people there for a longer period of time. We do not have sufficient trash containers to deal with, with the amount of uh, litter that is generated at those kinds of activities, but those are rare. Those are rare occurrences, and we can't just uh, park a trash container everywhere in the park. I mean, they're, they're, they're spaced the park as they should be, and they're the right number for the size of the park. But there will be times when uh, you just won't have enough uh, space available for the, ref for the, for the uh, litter that is generated. But the league has, has committed to taking care of that issue uh, for us. Uh, we provide the trash containers, we provide the trash bags, we dispose of the trash bags. Uh, it's not something that has been brought up to me, at least, as a, as a major well, issue. I'm just reading off the preamble that litter is a concern, and I, I understand that you have a certain capacity of what a trash can can hold on a given day, but wouldn't it be wise to, like you said, if there is an action that they're already taking, wouldn't that be included in the measure of understanding? that we would out outline what the expectation <clears throat> is for litter control? I suppose we could. I'm not sure just what kind of language would, would you know, would articulate that, uh, that particular issue. As, lo as long as I have a commitment from LAGSL and they know that I control their permit use, and if there is an issue, then they're, gonna, they're going to pay attention to it. Uh, I just know that there's, this is a very good document that has lots of things outlined and the litter is not outlined. Um, the next question I have is uh, on point number 8, 112 of 128. It says that we're going to agree to include improvements for Field 1 at Rush Park. I believe you mentioned that that's going to be surfaced in a couple of weeks when capital, uh, capital requests are, are formalized. Actually, we're having a, uh, a CIP committee meeting to deal with the current projects. Because we've had, as you know, we had a, an extensive project with the tennis courts, which used up monies that uh, that were uh, not anticipated. Uh, we need to look at the budget versus the current projects. And then the committee is going to look at in, uh, anticipated new needs. And that would be taken up as part of your mid-year budget adjustment in February. So the committee has the, has the, uh, the, the prerogative to delay or defer projects, uh, say take projects off the table, or, or uh, include new projects as recommendations to the board. <laughs> so this is simply in a, in a, um, a commitment that was made during negotiations that if the only way to reduce number of games at Rossmore Park was to make better use of Rush Park, that we would certainly look at that as a capital project. And that's, that'll be on, the, on, their, on that committee's agenda. Well, in the measure of agreement, it says point blank, RCSD agrees to include improvements for field one. For me to, at least for me sitting in my- To the committee agenda. I mean, okay, at Rush Park is part of the district's improvement committee agenda. Agenda. Just saying it's gonna be on the agenda. So that, okay, that's how- improvement committee meeting. Okay, thanks for clarifying. Let me uh, follow up with that because obviously it was a discussion item with the league and the Rossmore homeowners around the park and then our staff. What was discussed that's going to go on the agenda? What is the improvement that was discussed? Obviously there was some discussion. What was that? The ideal project would be to scrape that field to look as um, in, the, in the same configuration as field three at uh, Rossmore Park with dirtless dirt and, uh, you know, make it a playable field. 
and configured uh, for multiple use so that different age groups could use it. Right now, it's limited to six U's and eight U's, and as long as it's just six, eight, six and eights using it, then that doesn't that doesn't address the issue of uh, having those those young ladies uh, experience the Rossmore Park experience. And sure. I think it would be closer to field one, not field three, actually, in terms of size. Well, but it would look, uh, what, what I meant I was understand, the, the, but the but look of it would... Say that again, field... It, it, field one at Rossmore, at Rossmore Park is actually the size that all, key, all ages can play on. So scraping the field here would have to be similar dimensions, but with the dirt that we would have at field three. That was sort of the conversation. We want to get the, the dustless dirt, but make it big enough that it could be configured to any of the divisions and play on so that we could rotate games. They could rotate games, I guess, into that. Um, it could create greater so flexibility the, for schedule. So the 6U and the 8U group would go respectively to Rossmore Park, play on field one, which is a generic size not, field that accommodates six and eight year olds it wouldn't be it wouldn't be exclusive the idea is to be able to rotate games through both parks so that everyone gets a shot at it mm -hmm. okay field yeah. three is only for it's only set up for this the six u and eight u but two and one are for both correct and the one at Rushmore park the conversation for the cip committee would be to have that one be configured so all at rush all, park at Rush Park, excuse me, they all, they all could play on that. So but, all, but all with the goal of reducing the number of games at well, Rossmore Park. I just want to get something clear. Uh, field 3 currently at Rossmore Park, is it size for 6U and 8U, irrespective of the soil? Correct. And when we built the one field in Rush Park, we made then a duplicitous sized field as we have at Rossmore Park on field 3. Correct. Before that the was, scraping, yes. That was probably short-sighted? Um, no. I, I don't know if it was short-sighted. No, think no. If you, don't, if you don't mind me interjecting here. No, I, I um, want to get educated. That's yeah, so um, the girls' softball league plays them according to a governing body called, called ASA, which is the Amateur Softball Association, and they um, specify various field sizes for uh, various age um, groups, and, of course, along with that goes with various uh, uh, balls and um, equipment regulations and things of that nature um, so the, the original goal was to create this rush park platform or this rush park field uh, to to transfer six u games there's a real young young girls four five and six years of age it's a small ball they don't hit it far there's no worry about damage you know they can hit it not that not that far uh, we, and those were the girls that were playing like in the middle They're playing of, in the middle of grass. And so that was like the initial thing. Hey, hey let's get their, those games out from in between the three diamonds. Let's get them out of there. So that takes cars out of the park. It takes people out of the park and shifts them and, and just, and they get to play in a field as opposed to the throw down and on Friday nights and things like that. And I think we were, and I think we were pretty um, uh, successful in that um, endeavor. They, they got a nice park. The uh, secondary benefit was to move some of the 8U games because the 8U played on the same size field, the same size base, base paths as well as the pitching, as well as, as well as pitching mound um, on a um, ad hoc basis, shift some of the games but not, um, but not all the games. Uh, if, you, if you were to do a field one at we, at we, that we see at um, Rossmore Park, uh, the problem with going to a field one and moving girls above an 8U level say a 10U and 12U, um, one, you get into a harder ball. The ball travels farther. Uh, you, put, you get a 12U girl there playing with a, an 11 inch hard ball. Some of those girls, that uh, uh, they can be big. I mean, you get a five foot eight girl uh, swinging a 33 inch aluminum bat, hitting that uh, 11 inch hard ball, and that, and, that, and, and that ball can go 200 feet. Um, and then you start, so then you have to start to expand out the zone of what can't happen when there's a game playing there and you get a foul ball coming off the back of the backstop and you start worrying about damage to cars and houses mm -hmm. and they start so it was really like it would be nice to move everybody over here but you start having to put larger backstops up and fences and and it it it's a it's a it's a appealing an onion okay it never stops 
you 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 solve one like problem, you you get to the next problem, you get to the next problem. And your eyes are crying in the process. Yeah, and and you're like, oh god, I just I had the best of intentions, and it just it, it, it's spiraling out of control in this. And so, so that was why the original intent was to just to keep the sixes and eights, keep it on grass, minimize having to scrape turf out. Sure. It could still be used for alternative purposes, maybe. Uh, soccer field in the fall can encringe or can infringe on some of that. If you scrape it, you put in dirt, you start limiting. We can't put anything else there because now I've got dirt and I can't do lacrosse or soccer or anything like that or mm -hmm. boy or boys uh, or boys baseball because boys baseball doesn't use. Well, we don't dirt have that field. issue, right? They use they use grass and field. You did a pretty good explanation, don't you think? It's pretty so. good at that. <sighs> anyway, <laughs> getting back to this uh, agenda <clears throat> prospectively for the new fiscal year. I believe the idea then is to reduce the number of games in total played at Rossmore Park and bring some of the games here so that there be an equality in the usage in, of the park. I don't the know idea? if they're looking for a specific equality. I think that uh, looking for strategies to reduce traffic and parking issues at Rossmore Park. Yep. Clearly one of the strategies is to offload games somewhere else. And why does, you know, Rossmore Park have to be the entire hub for no, no, LAGSL, yeah. so. How do we make sure that we don't, uh, if that's where this goes, that we don't repeat history back at Rossmore Park, if that's the direction that this board entertains in the future? Well, I think that that's why it's, you know, one, the CIP committee has to look at this and make some recommendations of what it is. And I think, two, is looking at the policies, how they're stated and what, I mean, we'd have to really look at those and what wording and what restrictions we can put in to make that, make the park usage something that the community wants, and, you know, needs, but also satisfies the needs of our community that's living around the park. Mm -hmm. So that's something I think that's those two port, two things to go hand in hand. Mm -hmm. um, Okay, I just wanted to see what we're getting into because obviously, as Mr. Maynard brought forth, it says we agree to do something. And when you put it out there, there's a hope and there's an expectation, and I want to be transparent about it. I, I didn't know what those discussions were, so I, I'm sorry to belabor, belabor this discussion, but I wanted to know what we we're getting ourselves into. Well, we, did, we committed to bringing it to the, the CIP committee in good faith and to vet it out there. And not saying it was going to be on the CIPs and the budget for this year or next year or whatever, but that it would be get go through the process and then come back. Hopefully, you know, if it, the CIP committee says, "Yeah, this is a good thing," to come back to the board for approval whenever you know that it, it ends up on the um, whatever year it ends up in. Would it be uh, correct to then follow with the thought that this MOU would be up for revision? I think that there's uh, revisions that would have to happen if par park policy did change, that there would be revisions if we did. I mean, it does say in here, I think, to, to, to move games to, if, it, if their change does make, Mr. Tabwad, isn't there um, a statement in here about the usage of uh, Rush Park if, if there is a change to the field dimension? What, what we agreed to, Director Rips, is that we would not uh, put a, a hard number. To, a number, right. But, but that we would endeavor to uh, move those games in some fashion to to minimize the impact at uh, Rossmore Park. We couldn't put a number to it because unless right. and if this board were to approve capital improvements, there's only so much we can do. Right. And it, uh, the question might be, well, where else can these uh, games be played? And uh, we're going through a period right now where the elementary schools are going through uh, capital improvements themselves, and those fields have been taken out of out of the inventory, and people are scrambling right now to find a place to play. So there, the demand has gotten even even higher for any green space that's available. I have a, uh, a couple more questions, if you'd allow me to. Oh, thank you. Uh, pursue a bit. Um, let me. Um, let me call Mr. Zeitz, if you would indulge me just a minute. You know, on page 115, do you have that in front of you? 115 of 128? <clears throat> no apologies, I don't, but if you please read it. 115 of 128, do you have that? He's got the MOU memorized. Just, yeah. just, 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 just <laughs> I'm, I'm pretty okay. well versed on it, so you can. Well, here, uh, <laughs> here's what it states. Rossmore Park Neighbors RPN. This is the head notes <clears throat> in the middle of the page. <clears throat> and then there's three bullet, three sentences. And the third sentence states, the RPN agrees to reasonable limit. Well, grammatically, to me, it doesn't sound correct. Maybe agrees to a reasonable limit or reasonably limit any new issues it raises under the MOU. 
that's the first thing I, I wanted to bring to someone's attention from the RPN. <coughs> uh, grammatically, it doesn't read right. Uh, but number two, more importantly, why does the RPN want to agree to limit new issues? I, I don't understand what's not mm. spoken here. Well, as you can imagine, we tried to negotiate that entire section out um, unsuccessfully. Um, but we did add a, uh, an LAGSL section above it. So, <laughs> if, um, if I can address it, that. It's man. worded in such a way that you could drive a truck through it. So yeah. it's, <laughs> it's a, more of a, a professional, personal, moral. Okay. Well, I just wanted to get some that feel for what's if, going on. If here. people yeah. follow the MOU, yeah. that we need to have a vested interest in, in this document and, and also follow it. So, um, we didn't fight too hard to get that section. It was reworded a number of times. Thank you. President Coletta, the other side of the coin of that is that we, our CSD, wanted something in there that would balance out against the issue of having semi-annual meetings to sure. take up issues, mm -hmm. as opposed to taking them up on a daily, monthly, weekly basis. You want to do that? Not really. <laughs> <laughs> So if we reasonably, and I agree with you, reasonably is the, is the adverb that should be there. Sure. Uh, if, if no, I, I recognize that above uh, it is, it's in bold and ink uh, with regard to LIGSL. I'm just wondering, there's a difference in tone. One's yeah, well, bold, anyone with a legal or and, contracts uh, background so would, would uh, the entire are, document is yeah. worded loosely. Um, okay. It is an MOU, oh, yeah. it's not a contract. Mm -hmm. And okay. it's and, based on <clears throat> good faith, on all parties. Mm. Lastly, um, there are times uh, that I would have preferred different language. One of the words that's used, uh, or I first noted it is on page 111, and it's found throughout the document, is the word W-I-L-L, -L, will, as opposed mm -hmm. to shall. shall. And there were times I saw the word shall. Rarely. Can you explain why the interplay, what is the definition of will for this document? Will what does it really mean to should you? should are unacceptable in my personal language. Um, I like definitive statements. I like <laughs> facts. I like figures. I like data. I like to let the data stand on its own. Um, there are many words in that document that are unenforceable, as is the word will. Um, but in a neighborhood, where we're all neighbors, sure. and we're all residents, um, we didn't feel as though putting together a, a legal document was maybe that appropriate. Um, sure. So it, there is, a, I think, a lot of um, give and take. good intentions behind that MOU. Um, mm. Okay. So this was uh, composed by our staff here? Yes. Who's now on maternity <clears throat> leave? I'm sorry? Who's now on maternity leave? <laughs> ah, that person. Okay. Well, she did a good job. She did. She did a good job. She's not a lawyer either. No, I, 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 did, I see that. That's a good thing. <laughs> that's, a, she's, she's, that's probably why it's gotten this far. <laughs> um, uh, to, while I'm up here, and I got the mic, uh, uh, Mr. Maynard, uh, yes. Director Maynard, on the trash um, issue, I have lived at the park now for, what, 14 years, and it was worse before. It was substantially worse. Cars would back out from the stalls and there'd be bags of McDonald's um, just in between the cars and you didn't see them until the cars backed out and there they were. Um, the, the league has gone through different leadership changes and John is the, the current president and he is uh, a stand-up guy. He found and resurrected the uh, signage that he puts out along the, uh, the Greenway, Green Strip, throughout the park, uh, reminding people that, uh, that they're in a residential area, that there's neighbors here, don't block the driveway, pick up after yourself. And those nice red and white uh, signs, um, I think are effective. And I, I applaud him for finding them, dusting them off, and uh, reinstituting uh, that, that policy of installing them and picking them up uh, after each uh, of the Saturday games. So, so I think, um, even though it might not be written down, I think it actually is. My pages were sticking together. Oh, okay. I, I thought Ripps the LHL. It's on page 114, the very first one, that the softball league agrees to monitor trash, restrooms, and parking as well as water fields. So that was uh, my bad of not finding it. I was looking for it. I just couldn't find okay, it. Okay. So. I, I, I felt uh, they've made good faith efforts on, on That's that. That's good to hear. 
Uh, question, since you're up here and you're a fact and figure spreadsheet <laughs> kind of guy, um, obviously having more games over at Rush Park, what kind of decrease in number of games do you think will happen by having more games here? What's the percentage that in your spreadsheets are the outcome for the neighbors who now are in this area? I take all things into consideration and league enrollment is one that you can't turn a blind eye to. That there's many less teams than there were back in 2002 and 2003. And even off from the 2007, the original MOU, to now there's a 28% decrease in, in league member enrollment. So there's fewer teams. So I, I think the challenge uh, to get them all scheduled adequately to, to, uh, is not as difficult as it may s appear, especially if you go back to with all the teams, they, are, they had uh, six times, they played six games each at Rossmore and back in the peak. And that's now grown to eight so in a given uh, schedule uh, for the whole season, how many times does each team play there? Now, perhaps they were offloading games uh, back in the heyday of the high enrollment. Uh, there were playing some at Laurel, and the, and the league can speak more to where they were playing other than Rossmore and, and Rush. But given those venues and the decrease in enrollment, I do not feel as though the league would be uh, harmed in having a dramatic a reduction in the amount of games that are played. It may require them to schedule less games per team, but they've demonstrated in the past that that was accomplished. And they still got a full season in, and they still met the league rules. Uh, I imagine there's rules on how many games a team's got to play before they can go to playoffs and the and, and, and like. Mm -hmm. I think that's all things that we need to sit down and look at the actual scheduling data. And I want, of course, the minimum amount of games played, but I also want the league to, to flourish given their enrollment. I would like this uh, board to also consider the fact that if they do agree to some reductions and we don't allow the Bakersfield roving team to come in and, and take and destroy the good work we've done, that we have the flexibility in the future that if enrollment goes up, that we readdress it. Um, we want the Girls Softball League to play in Rossmore and we want them to do well. So I think... I, get, I want to try to rephrase my question. How many more games are now going to be played at this park versus Rossmore Park? What's, you, you can I, only, I mean, I'm just looking at capacity. Yeah, you can only play two or three uh, big girl games in, in a Saturday, so you know, that's the maximum would be... Usage here, that's all I'm trying to Are you talking out. about if the field got yeah. built out? Mm -hmm. I, I, I mean, we'd have to ask the league, but you're talking about... I guess every night of the week there's four games and there's three games on a Saturday, so I guess that's seven games that could be over here that weren't over there. That weren't here before. Yeah. I'm just trying, I mean, because if we have, I look at it, it's parks, yeah, it's not just one park. It's hard stuff. No. no. If stuff <laughs> moves there, there, then it comes over yeah, here. It, it is three. <laughs> I'd like to um, could I, recommend that we could I, focus <laughs> on the task at hand right. rather yeah, than, yeah, like, right. get so. into this tangent of future park planning. Can we kind of dial us back in and maybe that's an offline discussion about additional playing at the parks and things like that? Would be my suggestion. It's well, a very I, simple I, answer. Actually. Oh, you've got some, good, thank you. It's a simple answer. But, you know, it, the main issue was Saturdays, okay? Right. right now there are nine games, three per field. And the idea was if we could offload one game per field, that would be a huge deal. We're talking about three games. Okay. Maybe. Maybe, you know, and, and we said that would be, at one point we tried to get some language saying a goal of three. You know, maybe it wouldn't even get to three. So we're not talking about putting 50 games over here at Rush. Minor incremental changes make a huge difference in the parking and traffic situation. That's what we've learned in the MOU that we signed in 2008, it wasn't, I think we went down um, from 12 games to nine games in, on Saturdays. And that was a huge, that was an improvement. It was a, an improvement. And this would attempt to build on that. Um, 
and the idea was to get a field that was fully, fully flexible for all the age groups, and then it was, and if it worked that way, it could be used um, in the June tournament instead of wrapping up the June tournament at five or six on Sunday. Maybe it could be wrapped up at four. That that was just a potential. It, the uses of it could be very beneficial to the league and beneficial to us. Sorry. So, I hope Thanks that Thanks for that helps. explanation, Mr. Arbutin. Are we all exhausted on this topic? Uh, oh, yeah. <laughs> all right, then we need a motion tonight if, from somebody. I make a motion that we uh, accept the MOU as presented tonight. Second. Okay. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, motion carries 5-0. Thank you for everyone's uh, availability tonight to answer the questions. We now move to H2. Mr. President, members of the board, this is second reading the proposed revision to district policy number 2150, employee compensation and benefits, which adds a provision <coughs> for a compensation for a person who acts in a higher classification on a temporary basis. Uh, I recommend your approval as to second reading. Gentlemen, can I ask you to, to take the conversation outside? It's picked up on the microphone. And thank you. I'm sorry, Mr. Chapo, do you want to repeat yourself? <laughs> What's that, sir? You want to repeat yourself? I don't know if it was caught. <laughs> yeah, I don't know if I remember what I said. <laughs> I recommend approval of second reading on this uh, yes. particular. Uh, I, I make a motion that we accept policy 2150. Second. All right, any further discussion? We had this here last month. Yeah, we've heard, been there, done that. All right. No I just have my one question. I just want to make sure before I, this, I just, it, we talked about it being retroactive to the date that it starts. Does that actually say it in here? Did I miss that? Or does it need to say it in it here? It doesn't need to say that. No. It doesn't? Okay. But it is. It is. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I think that was a clear stipulation from last month. It was. I just wanted to make sure. That I it, believe. I didn't see it in here. So. Uh, all right. Then all in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. Motion carries. Policy is approved. Uh, H3. Mr. President, members of the board, uh, ISDOC, the Independent Special Districts Association of Orange County, is requesting your aye or nay vote on the 2012 membership dues. <laughs> A year ago, the dues were increased from $50 to $200 to include membership in another uh, uh, acronym, OCOG, uh, which is the Orange County Council of Governments, a joint powers agreement, which brings together all elements of government in Orange County as a forum for discussing all kinds of issues that relate to governance and to uh, legal and, and other fiscal and fiscal matters. So. Uh, it, they are asking for your approval for this, and uh, with, uh, with, with whatever uh, vote you make to uh, send this to ISDOC for uh, approval by the executive committee to take to uh, the next ISDOC meeting. All right, is there a motion this evening concerning this item? I make a motion that we uh, approve our $200 expenditure to be part of uh, ISDOC. I'll second that. Any discussion? Have you found that it is increased service or whatever the intent from 50 was supposed to give us something? Does it really do that? Well, what it does, uh, Director Maynard, is it gives us a seat at the table okay. with regard to what the state, county, and other jurisdictions like uh, SCAG, for instance, are uh, dealing with that affect all, all sorts of governments uh, within Orange County. And without a seat at that table, not only would we not know what was being contemplated, uh, we wouldn't have an ability to influence those decisions. So uh, from, a, from the standpoint of participatory, anyways, from collective government point of view, uh, it makes sense for us to have that seat at the table and be represented. And we get a, a quarterly report from ISDOC, uh, from uh, OCOG at each uh, ISDOC meeting. I wouldn't be able to attend their quarterly meetings unless we approve the monies. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, motion carries. Now, general <coughs> manager items. Sir? General manager items. I'd just like to give you an update on the uh, on our tennis courts. Uh, I sent you an email uh, dealing with when the um, 
tennis courts might be available for uh, use by uh, the tennis community. And uh, what I sent to you and what I'm going to tell you now is, is a bit different. Uh, what the contractor asked for was a 10-day period to do the resurfacing. Now, that 10-day period uh, contemplated that the courts would be open next Wednesday. The problem is that if we have rain over this weekend for the entire three days, as as uh, as predicted, uh, that uh, that might affect the actual opening. And for an opening ceremony, we would have uh, no window uh, other than the Thanksgiving Day weekend in order to have that grand opening. So uh, what I've asked you is to give me some f feedback, and I've received some from some from some of you as to whether or not we should proceed with having that uh, opening day ceremony after the courts have been in use for a period of time. So if you would respond to those emails, I'd appreciate that. I'm, I think that's all I've got. Board member items. Mr. Maynard, let's start with you. <laughs> You're going to start with me. <laughs> yes, sir. All right, going to start with me. Um, First One, set of eyes. Uh, very good. Um, <laughs> I want to thank the sheriff for coming out today and giving us his stats. I think we're all very encouraged by the response times uh, that have drastically improved uh, this time compared to last year's period. Director Maynard, if I could, uh, yes. when we did the MSR in 2005, the Municipal Services Review, we were looking at response times for priority one of 8 to 11 minutes. So the results have been dramatic. Yes. Even from quarter to quarter, but from that point this way, it's uh, it really is a dram dramatic improvement. The only the only issue there is whether or not the sheriff's budget will be able to sustain that level of enforcement. I really hope that they can because uh, it shows, and I know that's one of our biggest concerns as a community. Um, as the sheriff uh, lieutenant mentioned, uh, unfortunately, we have a lot of uh, property burglaries and theft. And this is just a reminder that uh, let's all be smart. Uh, let's lock our doors. Let's lock the gates. Let's lock our cars and let's not keep valuables in. Uh, a lot of these thefts, unfortunately, are ones that uh, if you just get back to basics, uh, they would probably go down dramatically. So I'd like to encourage people uh, to do just that. Um, last week, uh, Director Kalert uh, talked about what's going on with our neighbors who live uh, on Montecito and uh, what Seal Beach did with their housing elements. Uh, they did put their paperwork together and submitted it to the state. Um, however, it went to a person by the name of Melinda Coy, if you want to focus in on this, Melinda Coy. She's the person who's reviewing the package. Her email is mccoy at hcd.ca.gov. I bring this up because I know our neighbors watch the show, or at least they might see this on YouTube, and this is the time for you to actually put in your comments of how you feel this is affecting your neighborhood or anybody who lives close. I myself am just eight houses in from the Montecito uh, street, so I know that this affects myself. So anybody who feels passionate about this, this is the person that you would want to talk to. According to uh, the things that I have at least read about the process, is there's probably two issues that actually she would want to be, she would want to know. Is that one, some would consider this an abbreviated process that Seal Beach has taken, that uh, they went very fast, very quick, and some might say very stealth. Um, and the other one is lack of public participation. I went in there trying to find their housing element and I'm pretty web savvy, it's buried. So this, these two points in itself, conceivably if enough people speak up, could at least kick it back to the city so they can have a, a better further discussion. So again, if anybody's passionate about low income housing being rezoned in a business, I myself as a businessman, I don't like anybody telling me what to do with my land, my property, but in general if you feel strongly, Again, it's Melinda Coy. Here is her. I'll hand this to the producer if you wanted to put these on the screen in your editing. And again, the potential things that I feel they didn't do correctly was it was an abbreviated process and lack of public uh, participation. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Maynard. Mr. Ripps. 
I unfortunately did not bring any props tonight, so uh, I'll have to give out some props to a couple of people. Uh, I really wanted to to acknowledge Mr. Tabuata and and all the hard work that you did on the MOU, uh, and also clearly on on uh, the process that went through for the audit. Um, it's, uh, it shows all the dedication and commitment that you have, and and, and I, I really appreciate that on behalf of the community. And also a big thank you to Ms. Uh, Ms. Bell and uh, Ms. Gringas for the work that they did on the audit and also the the MOU. Um, it really was a pleasure to sit by both of you throughout the, all of those meetings and the preparation that went into it um, showed the professionalism that, that you guys bring to the community every day. So thank you very much. Um, and then, you know, I don't know the exact process of how we look at park policies or whatever, but I am definitely personally committed to continue the process to see this through. And so if there's any assistance I can give in that process with you, um, I am volunteering for that. Um, and I'm hoping, I guess I, I'm also asking you what that process is in terms of reviewing park policies and how that comes back to the board. Uh, Director Rips, uh, since the five and a half years that I've been here, uh, it has been your general manager who brings to you recommended policy changes. Uh, there's nothing that says that this board could not appoint a committee to deal with those policy issues so that they could be vetted and appropriately structured to, hello? Properly structured so as to um, make sense to the rest of the board as to the intention of those uh, changes. So if the, Mr. Director Coletta, if you wanted to do that at a later date, I don't suggest doing that tonight, but I'm saying that that's something that you might consider. If Mr. Ripps, that's what you'd like to do given your schedule, uh, I submit we need a volunteer. You can be the first to chair that, and if you'd like a volunteer to co-chair with you, speak up. If not... Uh, I think it would be... I started this process and I definitely want to see it through and I think that's one of the components that has to be looked at and so um, it's important to me to make sure that this I can take this through to the end and fortunately I also I'm on the CIP committee so I can look at it from that perspective and help with that at that range so I would if there's somebody else on the board that would like to step into that role and look at the park policies uh, it would be great to have a second set of eyes yeah sure I'd like to join you on that you got mr. Kaler right all right so we have a park policy review committee like a good title sounds good it's good for me okay anything else and that's all i got thank you um, Mr. Casey? Okay. uh yeah a couple things uh first of all uh, i'm very pleased that uh ignacio ochoa of the uh, orange county public works offered uh at least some support for us in terms of dealing with the paved over parkways i guess we received that letter a couple of weeks ago Correct. Stating that uh, if necessary, that he would go hand in hand with us and even send a letter to the residents if they did not comply with uh, allowing the planting of a tree in front of, of those sites. And I think, uh, Henry, you put uh, Randy Reynolds is working with the o with uh, Orange County on that, is that true? That's, that's correct, sir. Uh, so he, the process has started, I guess. Well, at, at least the, the preliminary meeting, I think we're cutting out here, the preliminary meetings between he and the uh, public works supervisor responsible for that project are already starting to talk about how, how to approach this. And obviously we wanna proceed with uh, care and caution so right. that you know, uh, we approach uh, these residences with the goal of the district and how to accomplish it and to try not to create any uh, issues that don't need to be created. And so, yep. a little TLC, as, as Randy likes to say, I go out and make <laughs> friends every day. Uh, we're going to try that approach and see if that works for us. And if it doesn't, we'll bring that back to you. Right. Well, you said he's excellent at public relations and that's been my observation as well. So I'm figuring that uh, this should work out quite well from at least. I'm that's, hopeful. That's my feeling right now. <laughs> Mine too. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, uh, one other item, I'd just like to offer my condolences to uh, the community of Seal Beach for the tragic and senseless incident that occurred there just over three weeks ago. And it, to me, it, it just shows no matter how careful and aware you are that uh, 
you're never too far away for some bad consequences uh, if you happen to be in the wrong place at the wrong time. And it's like, uh, unfortunately, there are times when life becomes uh, a very fragile commodity and uh, just subject to the whims of you know, wherever you might be at the wrong place at the wrong time. And uh, that's all I have. Director Kaler. I'm good. You're good. Yeah. Glad you're good. It looks good, too. <laughs> I wanted to thank you, Mr. Chabawada, for the, the concerted effort between the auditor and yourself and Ms. Bell in making our audit committee meeting very constructive, free-flowing, and um, to the point, understandable. Um, Brad did a phenomenal job in explaining and taking us from page to page, tracing um, the budget, the expenditures, um, the history on the wall, where we're at, and how it's uh, taken care of versus Rush Park. Um, and giving that explanation to both of us, Mr. Maynard and myself, it's always good to touch base with uh, all the nuts and bolts that we take for granted. And uh, you did a great job. And Mr. Brad, last name, I can't pronounce, I apologize. Will, Will, Willibur. 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 <laughs> yeah, he did a great job. And he's done that more than once. And uh, he's uh, an upstanding uh, CPA. Um, with regards to the MOU, it, you did a great job, Mr. Rips. Thank you for staying focused. And I appreciate the R Rossmore Park neighborhood. They, they stayed focused and they were very generous with the league. And their attitude was great. Their attitude was very good on both sides. And I appreciate that. And lastly, it's nice to see um, follow through with the county and their street maintenance crew addressing the resident at uh, Orangewood and is it Shakespeare? I believe that's correct. That was a sidewalk? Is today they right? poured the curb. Oh, the it curb. Was, yeah. It was all broken up for years and they, they addressed it today and that was pretty quick. That was very good. It was very nice. So I'm sure those residents are happy. And thank you for putting that on the radar screen for. Uh, and we also planted some trees and did some other stuff. <laughs> that happened last month and I'm very thankful for that and it looks great. Uh, on uh, Wallingsford. And no, it, it really helps when people bring those things to our attention. Uh, we can't uh, get the county on some of these if we don't know about it. And uh, to the extent that you're out there with, you know, watching the uh, with eyes and ears, and if you bring it to our attention, we'll make sure it gets to the appropriate agency. Well, I commend Mr. Ochoa for responding to us regarding the parkways. Oh, yeah. Those which are uh, void of a tree and not consistent with our policy, but yet again, they're also very paved over, which is inconsistent with Orange County policy. I imagine those locations don't have permits, if my memory serves me correct, on the poll survey we had Mr. Reynolds conduct. Well, of those uh, 12 sites, or 21, was it 21 sites that we, uh, that we identified, only two of them had permits. So I'm thankful for that. My pleasure. I have nothing else. And so with that, uh, we have no closed session. So is there a motion to adjourn? So motion. Second. All right. All in favor, aye, please. Aye. 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 We're adjourned. Thank you.